Welcome to the Conroy Center's live stream virtual visit with Matthew A. Talon. Matt is co-author with his father, Lieutenant Colonel Joseph F. Talon, of his father's newly published memoir, 100 Days in Vietnam. Acclaimed filmmaker Ken Burns praised the memoir with these words. Joseph Talon's story, told through his wartime letters, recollections, and the words of his son, is a moving account of an American family's experience with war, loss, and remembrance. 100 Days in Vietnam offers readers both a rare window on the final days of our painful national odyssey in Vietnam and a remarkable record of an individual's determined quest to honor a fallen comrade. Our presenting author tonight, Matthew A. Talon, is a former U.S. Army transportation officer who served primarily in overseas duty assignments for five years and completed his active duty commitment as a captain. Matt is a graduate of Duke University with a bachelor's degree in history and a teaching certification. Certification. After completion of his military service, Matt returned to Durham Public Schools to teach high school U U.S. history and civics. After graduating from Harvard with a master's degree in education policy and management, Matt currently serves as the senior project manager of the Public Education Leadership Project, a joint education initiative between the Harvard Business School and Harvard Graduate School of Education. We're honored to have Matt with us here in the Zoom room and live on the Conroy Center's Facebook page. Our Zoom audience is welcome to ask questions for Matt throughout the chat feature box in Zoom, which we'll have time to answer later in the hour. Copies of 100 Days in Vietnam are available locally here in Beaufort through the Beaufort Bookstore. And in the chat, I'll also be posting a link to purchase the book through bookshop.org. So thank you everyone for joining us and please welcome our author, Matthew A. Talon. Hey, thank you. Thank you very much, Brooke, for uh, that excellent introduction. And I wanna thank you know, the Pat Conroy Literary Center for hosting me and, and my family. I've got friends and family on, on, online tonight watching and appreciate everybody who's joined in tonight. And I wanna say a special thank you to Jonathan, who's the executive director of the Pat Conroy Literary Center. He has truly been a, a very instrumental assist in this book getting out, in this uh, book reaching audiences and connecting us to great authors around the country like Kathleen Rogers, who's online tonight. So Jonathan has just been excellent at pointing us in the right direction. And it's clear from both his bio and his body of work that he does, you know, eat, sleep and breathe, helping authors and helping launch authors and helping mentor authors. Uh, so for a new author like myself and my father, you know, it's, it's just uh, been great to have, have your assist and your advice uh, and, and the backing of this center, because obviously we have a lot of love and respect for Pat Conroy and his work and just uh, appreciate the legacy you're carrying forward and the assist that you're giving uh, young authors. So thank you uh, for that. Um, I'm gonna open by, I'm gonna share uh, a, a slide deck of some images uh, as I speak tonight, uh, but I'm not gonna talk a lot about the images. I'm gonna share some stories and uh, share some inspiration behind this book and some of the scenes from the book that I hope you find uh, engaging and compelling. Um, the first thing I'm going to share, though, before I even get into my book is um, my inspiration, you know, it's the Pat Conroy Literary Center, so I thought I would talk about what inspired me to write, you know, what are my inspirations for being a writer, and so I, I brought this excerpt here today, this is uh, the Pine Log High School newspaper from 1976, uh, this is a December 1976 issue, and I got this out of my mother's archives. My mom taught high school English at Somerville High School for over 30 years. And way back in 1976, she actually was part of a group uh, that hosted Pat Conroy uh, there for a, a talk with the students. And, you know, obviously that was a pretty big deal. It was the Quill and Scroll Society, as well as some of the journalism students there who, who brought him in. And um, this is the, the paper that ran uh, after that visit, and I'm going to share, you know, some excerpts from the paper. Here's an image uh, from the second page, but in rereading the article and talking to my mother about that visit, uh, a couple of things stood out. Conroy spent a lot of time uh, talking about the Somerville High School football team, which is legendary across the Palmetto State, 
uh, their, their coach, John McKissick's not only the winningest coach in the state of South Carolina, he's the winningest football coach at any level uh, across the country, NFL, college, high school. So, you know, that they were legendary even in those days. And uh, Pat Conroy talks about the fear of playing Somerville and what they were facing when he was in high school in Buford. So that came through a lot in his talk. The other thing that was interesting that came through is he, he talked a lot about being mistaken for John Voight. The movie Conrad had just come out and John Voight had snatched away his identity, apparently. Uh, a lot of people were looking at him and saying, you don't look like Conrad. Uh, you know, like they, they were expecting it uh, to see John Voight. Uh, so it was his first book turned into a movie. And I guess everyone was starting to mistake, uh, you know, John Voight as Pat Conroy. And I'm sure if Pat Conroy were alive today, he really wouldn't want that uh, comparison given the toxic politics of John Voight uh, in the present era. But uh, it was interesting to hear him talk about that movie coming out and he was just putting out uh, the great Santini as he did this visit. So it was an interesting time in his, in his career and it was a nice uh, event that my mom was part of. But I would also say, um, you know, that book, The Water is Wide, remains probably my favorite Pat Conroy book to this day. Uh, I became a school teacher. I was raised by two school teachers. So even though my father's a retired Lieutenant Colonel, um, part, a, a large chunk of his military career was done in the reserves, in the Army Reserves, which means he had a day job that was civilian and his day job became uh, teaching high school social studies, history and civics and government at a small school, uh, St. George High School in Dorchester County. And obviously I told you my mother teaching in Somerville. So um, the water is wide really connected with me on multiple levels, being a child of South Carolina and being an educator and a child of educators. Uh, I, that, that book, and I just reread that book recently. Uh, and you know, I think it's, it's similar to my approach with teaching and in reading. You know, that book speaks to me because I think books can take us off of our personal islands. So the interesting thing about Conroy's work on Yamacraw Island was those, those students and those kids there had not seen the outside world. They were isolated. And pretty much everything he did was this deluge of exposure of what is out there. And he really got to see it firsthand, people, people learning uh, on the cusp of learning every day that he, he worked at that school. And uh, that's always the approach that I wanted to take in the classroom is how many different things can I expose the students to uh, from outside their comfort zone or outside of their, uh, you know, their, their little world? And can we expand that and expand learning? Uh, so the inspirations for me, obviously a big inspiration for me writing this book and writing in general is Pat Conroy and specifically the water is wide. And then a second inspiration I wanna highlight is my mother being an English teacher. She's my first writing teacher. Um, it comes through in this story that I'm showing here with Pat Conroy, but um, you know I would say that you know she pushed me in a direction of loving words, loving language, uh, trying to push myself better. I remember her teaching me to diagram sentences as a young kid in grade school at a time when diagramming sentences has fallen well out of fashion, but I felt like it really helped me with cynic structure and just learning the basics of writing. Uh, so I really appreciated her taking that time out. And I actually did that with my kids recently during the pandemic. I, uh, we, we spent some time in 2020 with my mother uh, doing some virtual sentence diagramming with my third and fifth grader, uh, just because I thought it was a good, like not only time to connect with grandma, but it was also a good foundation for their uh, learning the English language sentence structure and, and how to build their thoughts. So those are two major inspirations for me as a writer. A third inspiration, and I might go a little bit against the grain of what you're supposed to do in your book talk. Uh, I'm gonna share a piece of writing from another author uh, before I even get into my book. So, um, you know, I, I fell in love with William Faulkner as a college undergrad. Uh, and this is almost, this is 20 plus years ago now. Uh, I, I had a class on early 20th century American literature where we read one Faulkner book and I decided to go deep and take a Faulkner course. And I attempted at the time to read every novel Faulkner wrote. And I think I came up just too short, but I, that was an investment because uh, you know, he has a deep catalog. And this, this quote from his Nobel Prize winning uh, speech, this quote here is one that always resonates for me. 
about why I read books and why now I write books. And that is that human heart in conflict with itself. Like that, that's, you know, I think I agree with him totally that that's the only thing worth writing about and worth the blood, sweat, and tears. And um, I think that that is what we have tried to tackle in our book here, 100 Days in Vietnam, is the human heart in conflict with the self. And hopefully um, we have wrestled with that throughout these pages. And that comes through in, in how my father and I collaborate on this narrative. So I'll just share a very short excerpt from uh, one of my favorite, uh, and I think most accessible William Faulkner books, As I Lay Dying. You know, some folks say that Faulkner is not accessible, but if you have not gotten into the Faulkner literature, I would say As I Lay Dying is an accessible starting point. So if, if you know anything about the story, um, there's a couple in the book, Ants and Addie, Bundren and Addie, the, the, the mother, the matriarch, the, the wife of Ants is slowly dying at home and, and in a glorious, is not a glorious uh, death. And she's uh, quite disgruntled with her life. Uh, and at this point in time, Ants has waited way too long to call the doctor for a visit, mainly because Ants is a cheap man and he doesn't like to spend money. And, uh, you know, the doctor coming out to where they live and they live on top of a high bluff, not unlike Beaufort situated on the high bluff by the river, but the Ants' cabin or house is on a high bluff and the doctor's got to come up on a rope to get up there and there's a storm approaching and the doctor's worried about even getting back off the bluff and getting home safely. But here he is to visit uh, Miss Addie on her deathbed. So this is a short excerpt here from Dr. Peabody. This is in the voice of Dr. Peabody in his chapter. The boy overtakes us. Ants looks back at him. Where's the rope, he says. It's where you left it, I say. But never you mind that rope. I got to get back down that bluff. I don't aim for that storm to catch me up here. I'd blow too darn far once I got started. The girl is standing by the bed, fanning her. When we enter, she turns her head and looks at us. She has been dead these 10 days. I suppose it's having been a part of ants for so long that she cannot even make that change, if change it be. I can remember how when I was young, I believe death to be a phenomenon of the body. Now I know it to be merely a function of the mind and that of the minds of the ones who suffer the bereavement. The nihilists say it is the end, the fundamentalists, the beginning, when in reality, it is no more than a single tenant or family moving out of a tenement or a town. She looks at us, only her eyes seem to move. It's like they touch us, not with sight or sense, but like the stream from a hose touches you. The stream at the instant of impact as dissociated from the nozzle as though it had never been there. She does not look at ants at all. She looks at me, then at the boy. Beneath the quilt, she is no more than a bundle of rotten sticks. That's just a little taste of As I Lay Dying. But the reason I'm pointing to that, uh, the writing of Faulkner and uh, particularly that book for inspiration is not that I think that 100 days in Vietnam can touch the writing of William Faulkner. We're not in that league. But um, it's because growing up, my, father, my grandfather, Harry Talon, and if you look at this photo here, Harry Talon is the seventh son of an Irishman, an Irish farmer, grew up on a farm in upstate South Carolina. That's, it, that's young Harry there in the center with the, the hand on his shoulder. And above him are his six older brothers around him. And they're on the farm there. And this is taken in the, the late 1920s. And in, in a time when there was still a little bit positivity around the family, right before the depression comes and takes this family farm away from them. But, you know, at this moment, you got a loving family of seven brothers. The stories that Harry would share growing up, talking to my grandfather, my father, some of my relatives. When I started reading Faulkner, it really resonated with me because I felt like I was hearing stories in William Faulkner that was very similar to the stories that I would hear from life on a farm or life growing up or life in the country from extended family members. And so I, I wanted to point to Harry in particular in this, uh, in this book because, you know, Harry's a big reason and Harry's my grandfather. He's a big reason, even though he's passed on and he's not a main character in this book, 
he does show up in this book um, and, and it helps push us uh, to do this writing. So I'm gonna share with you a little excerpt from 1972, June 6th uh, to, to illustrate this point. At that time, you know, that's D-Day. My father's in Vietnam. So I'm taking you into the middle of his deployment. And he just happens to be thinking about his father, my grandfather, because it's, it's Vietnam. It's, yeah, excuse me, it's uh, D-Day. So in this scene, it's just uh, Joe reflecting back on what Harry did that day. Today is the anniversary of D-Day. This afternoon, I thought a lot about my father. He was involved that day in one of his toughest days. He's always been quite quiet about it, but not long before my departure for Vietnam, I did get him to talk a bit. He told me he manned a dual 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun on a landing craft vessel that shuttled medical supplies into the beaches and shuttled wounded Americans back out to the hospital ships waiting offshore. His craft made six trips back and forth to the beach. When I asked him which beach, he said they went to all of them, but he did say that on some of the beaches, you could walk from the vessel to the beach on the backs of dead American bodies floating in the water. His boat only picked up the wounded and stacked the stretchers on the floor while my father provided cover. After each trip back to the hospital ship, they used a shovel to remove the empty brass casings from below his gun and throw them into the ocean before bringing on more ammunition and more medical supplies. The only injuries he suffered that day were some minor burns on his legs from all the hot brass falling from his gun. After six round trips, they removed my father to get something to eat since he had been at it all day. And he was the only one not to be wounded yet on his vessel. On the seventh trip to the beach, the vessel never returned to the hospital ship. A German artillery shell directly hit it while it was in the surf. My father is the seventh son of an Irishman and he has always counted himself lucky and none, and none more so than that day. So again, this is just illustrating that uh, if we put it in the context of 100 days in Vietnam, there are opportunities for Joe, and this is Joe Talon's voice, there's opportunities for him to reflect back on his life before Vietnam. And some, you know, in this instance, he's reflecting back on a story that his father shared with him before he went off the war to Vietnam. He got a little bit of information out of Harry uh, about his experience. I'm gonna share now uh, a little reflection from the quest section of my book um, to give you another little flavor of what it was like for me. Um, you know, it, this is in my voice reflecting back on my father and my childhood. And this is gonna make sense when I put it into the context of the introduction and why we wrote this book. So please bear with me and stay with me, but this is gonna all feed into why we wrote this book in the introduction. So this is, a, this is in my voice in a section of the book called The Quest. Growing up, I didn't know what caused the injuries to his body or the scars on his arms and legs. But even as a, young, a very young kid, I knew something really bad must have happened to my dad. I saw it each time he got out of the shower and methodically applied Vaseline intensive care lotion to the grafted areas of scarred skin left mottled and hairless. I saw it in the calm non-reaction he once had when he leaned a weed eater against the gutter of our house and the string whipped ferociously against the grafted skin on his shin, leaving multiple red welts in the numb nerveless skin. I saw it when he occasionally pulled up from a task, straightened his lower back and quietly winced in pain. We spent a lot of time together working in the yard and long before I was ever allowed to push the real lawnmower myself, I had my own Fisher Price corn popper toy mower which I pushed around the lawn a few steps behind my dad as he cut the grass. I loved the smell then and still love the smell today of a freshly cut lawn. As much as the yard work was simply required of me, whether it was picking up pine cones or magnolia blossoms or weeds, I think I also wanted to please my dad and do the task well. When I wasn't quite six years old, I tried to help him lift the lawnmower out of the back of his Datsun pickup. My job was to hold the front of the mower by the tops of the front wheels and as I bent down to place the wheels on the driveway, 
my dad suddenly let go of the back end, causing both the mower and him to crash to the pavement. I immediately thought I had done something wrong. He screamed out in pain. A neighbor came running from two houses down and we somehow got him inside to his bedroom. When the ambulance came to retrieve him, the paramedics couldn't fit him through his bedroom door on the fracture board. So firemen were called in to remove the bedroom windows. My mom, my, my brother Josh and I watched as firemen slid him out the rectangular hole, which used to be windows on two fire ladders that served as slide guides. Josh was not quite three years old yet, but observing the scene, he asked my mom, is daddy dead? He wasn't dead at all, but he was the tall and strong one in the family, the one who made sure all the doors were locked in the house at night, and who reached things for my mom on the highest shelves and sharpened the kitchen knives and lit the kerosene heater. He was the one who pushed the boat off the trailer to go fishing, and the one who cut and split the logs for the fireplace. Yet it wasn't a chainsaw that felled the tall live oak of our family, but an old lawnmower and a bad back, for which I really didn't understand the cause. In the self-centered world of a five-year-old, I thought that I was the cause and that I had made him hurt bad enough to go to the hospital. I didn't know the back problem started in Vietnam. On the same night, they deactivated the last remaining battalion of American combat troops at the tail end of a drip, drip, drip fighting faucet that the country had been slowly and painfully trying to cut off for years. I didn't know about the Mohawk or the night of the crash or the Martin Baker ejection seat or even the presence of a man named Daniel Richards. So that, that's an excerpt from my, a section in my voice. It's actually towards the end of the book in the quest, but it actually speaks to my childhood and, and some of the reflections I had about my father's injuries from the war and really not understanding how, it, how they happened or where they came from. So I, I, set, I set the table with those segments to bring you to the introduction. And the introduction is again, a section in my voice. So I'm trying to start out mainly with the sections that are written in my voice, which are the introduction and the final quest section. So we're starting there and then we'll come back to my father's voice in the heart of the book. So I'm gonna start now with the introduction and give you a sense of the why we wrote this book and the why we persisted with it. I had time. I was 25 years old, an army first lieutenant. The busload of fellow officers and I rode downhill from the French town of virville samar to the beachfront, then to the dog green sector of Omaha Beach. We stood in a gaggle near the surf, listening to the guide. The sky was overcast, but didn't look like rain, and the waves rolling in were small, allowing us to hear our guide easily over the surf. The smell of exposed seaweed and algae-covered rocks hung in the air. The guide led us over the sand to the easy green sector. There, an old man with a scraggly gray beard stood, stoop neck next to two younger men, his arm resting on one of their shoulders for support. On his head was a black ball cap with gold braid lettering, World War II veteran, it read. One of our officers chatted him up. He was standing with his two sons on the exact spot on the beach where he came ashore at H hour plus three, or three hours after the invasion began on June 6, 1944. He was a young private first class then and talked with reverence about his sergeant's ingenuity at keeping his team alive while he and his fellow soldiers hopscotched around dead bodies as they ran back and forth for supplies at the landing craft. Our executive officer asked him what he did during that first hour he was on the beach. I shook, he replied, his eyes wet with tears. Suddenly it felt like we barged into a silent cathedral and interrupted this old man and his sons at an altar in prayer. Sensing our intrusion, our battalion commander moved us along. I wish my own grandfather were there with me to re retrace his steps on the Normandy beaches. I fought back my own tears, not wanting to appear soft in front of my officer peers. My grandfather, Harry, was a 20-year-old gunner in the Navy when he approached the shores at Normandy. I knew he had been there, but I knew nothing about his experience. What did this beach look like to him? Did he shake as well when he saw it? Did he get to the beach, or did he stay on one of the naval ships offshore? Our group made its way up the slight incline of the beach in the same direction that the assaulting Allied forces moved on D-Day. We reached the long parallel 
pile of smooth rocks called the shingle what remained of the only death laid that would have separated troops from the relentless German machine gun fire. Many of us laid prone on our bodies alongside it to get a better sense of the perspective our fighting forebears would have had six decades earlier. I thought about the German bolt action Mauser rifle that my grandfather brought back from Normandy and wondered how he came to have it. Our guide led us up a winding trail through Le Moulin Draw to the top of the large ridge line over land that would have been littered with buried mines and barbed wire. Americans assaulting the ridge line on June 6, 1944 would have found enemy bunkers and trench lines to engage at the top. When we came over the rise, we found instead a large, beautifully manicured lush green lawn containing the most striking military cemetery I had ever seen. Our unit leadership brought with us a large floral wreath with a banner across it emblazoned with our 28th Transportation Battalion name and colors. We laid it at the prominent central monument that housed bells that rang at that moment playing the Star Spangled Banner. We stood silently at attention. A group of French armor officers in uniform passing by stopped and saluted. The anthem was followed by taps as we looked out across a field of thousands of white crosses and occasional stars of David. Again, I wished my grandfather were there with me. After the wreath laying ceremony, we were on our own to explore the cemetery. I stopped at Theodore Roosevelt Jr.'s grave, one among the many. As I walked, I let my fingertips graze the tops of the stone markers, aware that buried under each marker was a man, likely closely to my age when he had been killed. I made my way to the edge of a high bluff overlooking the beach. In the distance, along the edge of the rolling channel, sir, I spotted two horses and riders crossing the easy red sector of Omaha Beach. The riders seemed unhurried and let their horses playfully splash in the edge of the surf. I envisioned how different the scene would have been there on Omaha Beach 60 years earlier. I stood near where Germans would have rained fire down on the attacking force. My grandfather had been there, had survived this brutal assault, but I knew nothing of his experience. Right then, I resolved to find out to talk to my grandfather and document his D-Day memories. I had time. I'll skip forward in the introduction. Uh, I talk more about some time I spent with my grandfather in the next couple of years. I'll go to the end of the introduction. My grandfather had two main reflections about his old age. The first was that he would have taken a lot better care of himself had he known he was gonna live that long. The second was his oft repeated phrase, Life is like a roll of toilet paper. It moves faster and faster the closer you get to the end. I didn't realize just how fast things were moving for him. Over the next two years, while I was starting a new career as a high school history teacher in North Carolina, he was shuttling to the hospital every other month to get excess fluid drained or to deal with some other complication from congestive heart failure. I kept thinking that I was gonna have time to sit down with him during the summer break and finally document his experiences from the war, especially those on D-Day. On a late August night in 2008, while I was driving a moving truck through Connecticut, I got the call. Harry was dead. I had run out of time. When my dad came to me less than a year after Harry's death and handed me a stack of yellow legal pad pages with handwritten remembrances from his service in Vietnam, I vowed not to let the opportunity pass me by as it had with my grandfather. We were gonna do something with these memories. I quickly realized how little I knew about my dad's wartime experiences and his life as a young man. I knew he had survived just barely, ejecting from his plane after being shot down. I had seen the roadmap of burn scars on his body and I had watched his eyes swell up as he touched the name on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Wall on a childhood trip to Washington, DC. I survived and he didn't, was all he told me at the time. But I didn't know that my dad wrote letters to my mom almost every single day he was in Vietnam. Contained in those letters was not only a passionate love story, but also a chronicle of the insecurities of a young lieutenant whose place in the unit and purpose in the entire war effort was very uncertain. I dug deeper. We pulled back the emotional and mental scabs and reconstructed his time in Vietnam and the childhood experiences that shaped him. What I found in my dad's past was not only my own origin story, but also the classic struggle so many young men of that baby boom generation went through to prove themselves to their parents, who cast such long shadows as members of the reputed greatest generation. What follows are his recollections of his 104 days in Vietnam, coupled with primary source documents, such as the aforementioned trove of handwritten letters sent from Joe to Martha Ann, and audio cassette recordings they exchanged as a means of wartime communication. 
Other primary sources, such as the unit yearbook and additional artifacts, are supplemented with contemporary newspaper reports to situate Joe's 1972 experiences into the greater historical context. Using his uncanny remembrance of detail, along with these other sources, which were minimally copy edited for clarity, my father and I recreated his experience into the first two parts of this narrative, the deployment and the recovery told in a first person journal entry style. The third part, the quest, is my account of his tireless efforts to bring long overdue recognition to the observer lost in the Vietnam plane crash that changed my father's life. So I'll stop there. That's the end of the introduction, but that gives you a sense of not only why we chose to write this book, but some of the unique structural components that we brought together and wove together. And sometimes I use the term tapestry uh, to describe it because we do layer in. It was a process of construction and deconstruction and layering in of, of different sources to try to make uh, that experience in the deployment uh, feel very real to the reader, feel very present in the moment. So what you're getting here, rather than 74-year-old man, as Joe is now reflecting back in this memoir, you're experiencing Vietnam in 1972, which was a terrible time to be there in a terrible war at the very bitter end, but you're experiencing it as he experienced it day to day, the day by day drudgery. Um, and then obviously the, when things exciting or when things scary happen, all of that is all uh, unfolding with you as you read through uh, the 100 days chronology in the, in the, in the deployment section, uh, which makes up the heart of the book. Um, and then talking about those current events that we use uh, to supplement the book. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. I, uh, I do wanna, go to one, here we go. Uh, I'll talk about the uh, current events. This is a photo that appears in the book. It's a very famous photo by Nick Oot. We got permission from uh, the Associated Press to run it in the book. Um, other current events that were unfolding while Joe was deployed to Vietnam uh, are, include Nixon's visit to the Soviet Union and meetings with Brezhnev, the McGovern versus Nixon campaign of 72. Uh, John Paul Van dies. If you know a lot about Vietnam War history, Lieutenant Colonel John Paul Van was a central character, spent over a decade in Vietnam in multiple roles, uh, and is the subject of a great book, uh, if you haven't read it, by Neil Sheehan called A Bright Shining Lie. Um, Paul Van loses his life in a helicopter accident while my dad's there. Um, Bobby Fischer is having his famous chess match with Boris Spassky, and we talk about how that actually in influences my father's life in the motor pool. Uh, Jane Fonda makes a very uh, what's become a very notorious visit among Vietnam veterans uh, to, to Vietnam at the time uh, in, in protest of the war and trying to stop the war. Uh, that happens. The Watergate break-in happens in June of that year, uh, as well as Kissinger, Henry Kissinger having numerous secret meetings about the war uh, and the deactivation of the last uh, ground unit, which happens in August of 72, the last American combat battalion is deactivated. So a lot of interesting current events are unfolding in this context in which um, my father is operating in Vietnam. Um, I wanted to show you about how we enter, enter the deployment story. We made a conscious decision uh, to, you know, in an earlier draft of this book, we had this traditional chronology of like childhood, followed by training, followed by the war, followed by the recovery. We had that long arc in the war came more in the middle of the book. We made a conscious decision to take the reader as quickly as possible to Vietnam. So once you hear that introduction I just read, we put you right at the airport. We put you at Charleston Municipal Airport, Charleston, South Carolina, getting ready to depart for the Vietnam War. I'll give you a little sense of that scene uh, there at the airport. Uh, and that's where this, uh, this image applies. Um, this is Joe at the airport on May, May 8th. It's a Monday, Monday, May 8th, 1972. It's our very first journal style entry in, in the uh, narrative. A trip to the airport is a rarity for my family, but everyone seemed to know the unwritten dress code. Passengers getting ready to board the plane were dressed up, men in coats and ties and women in dresses and heels. Even my uncle Willard, married to my mom's older sister, Grace, was wearing his Sunday best though I know he is more at home in a pair of khaki work pants or a hunting jacket than a shirt and tie. 
We were fishing and hunting buddies while I was growing up. He's a crack shot with any weapon he puts his hands on. Uncle Willard put his hand on my shoulder. My tax dollars are paying for all your bullets, he said. Don't waste any of them. My cousin Liz handed me a copy of the New Testament. The Bible was about as big as the palm of my hand. We inscribed it, she said. I took it in my hands and opened the black leather cover. Good luck and Godspeed, Liz, Chuck, and Bev was written in blue ink on the first page. Thanks, Liz, I said. I'll take this with me wherever I go. And I knew I would. As my boarding time approached, my family and I walked as an ensemble down the wide covered sidewalk to the gate. A four foot high cyclone fence separated the sidewalk from the tarmac where the plane sat. There was no security present, just a sign on the chain link fence that read, ticketed passengers only beyond this point. Looking out from the fence on the far side of the runway, I could see the planes and hangars of the Charleston Air Force Base. My mother was not present. After saying goodbye to my father so many times during World War II, she told me she could not watch me leave for war. During that war, she went nine full months without any word from my father, but she hoped it would be easier to stay in touch with me. The night before last, I stood with her in the kitchen, a wad of tear dampened Kleenex in her apron pocket. Write to me, she said. I told her I would. At the airport, my dad, a talker by disposition and trade, was unusually quiet. He was in his work clothes, short sleeve, white dress shirt, thin black necktie, dress slacks, and polished shoes, the trademark outfit of a traveling salesman. He took Monday afternoon off from his job with Pig Wiggly, selling greenback stamps to be there. Leaning in, he shook my hand while at the same time depositing a set of brass knuckles in my pocket. Look at me directly in the eyes, he said quietly. Use these if the fighting gets in real close. I'll stop there at that scene, but that's kind of why I, I put this image together is I really love the yin and the yang of at his departure being given both a Bible and a pair of brass knuckles. And I believe it is, is actually emblematic of Joe's character throughout the book, where at times he fights and scraps his way through training and uh, is very... Um, angry and standoffish sometimes uh, and, and difficult. And at times he's having, uh, you know, uh, moments of doubt about the morality of war. And he's going to his college professor and saying, you know, as a Christian, how can I go off the war and support killing people and uh, having a real crisis of conscience on the other hand. So uh, I thought that this imagery at the, at the airport really uh, sums up kind of the yin and yang of his own uh, personality. I'll also give you a taste. I'll, I'll give you a taste because we. I want to leave time for a question and answer. So I'm gonna give you a taste of a couple of the components that um, make up the book. So this is uh, just one letter. There are a number of letter excerpts that my father writes to his new bride, Martha Ann. And that's one of the joys about this book coming out in 2021 in June. This book was just released on June 15th. My parents are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary, July 2nd of 71, uh, of 2021 is their 50th anniversary, but it's really nice that this book comes out and celebrates their, the infancy of their love story here at the 50 year mark. Um, so you, you will see throughout these letters, it's a deep, a deep love story that has endured for, for 50 years now. Um, I'm gonna give you one, one letter that he writes because it also gives some context into his life at, on the airfield. My father is the new lieutenant, was given a bunch of extra duties, a lot of the things that the pilots didn't want to do to include running the motor pool in the motor pool operation. None of the pilots wanted to deal with the wheeled vehicles. And the only people that were sent to be mechanics in the motor pool were the people that they didn't trust, the soldiers they didn't trust to work on the airplanes. So these were the guys who were high all the time. They were AWOL all the time. Uh, they became, uh, under, my Joe's, under my dad Joe's leadership, he referred to him as the misfits of the motor pool, but that was one of his extra duties uh, was to run the motor pool. So that comes through in this letter as well. So I'll read a letter that was written on uh, day 48, uh, Monday, June 26. So ironically, that's in two days from now, we're two days from now, 49 years ago, this letter was written. Dear Martha Ann, I'm flying again now, and it really helps. I think if I could not fly, I would go completely crazy over here. I just plain hate to go to that motor pool. I wish every night that the VC would mortar the motor pool instead of the aircraft. I think I would even pay them for the help. 
the supply system has gone to pot over here. I cannot get any parts to fix my broken trucks. I think I'll turn in most of them for salvage. The Vietnamese get all new trucks and we get the old worn out ones. I don't like this system at all. I hope we go to Thailand and leave all of these trucks here. I would be the happiest officer in our company. I flew up north with my roommate, Pat, today. We got some very good imagery. It was a slur mission. He carried his camera and we have some pictures of North Vietnam and some of us by our aircraft after the mission. If they turn out okay, I'll send you some. It is really hot here. I think July will be even hotter. If I do, if I do not live through this war, at least you will know I'm in heaven because I've already served my time in hell. If you die over here and go to hell, you would have to wear a coat when you got there. We're about a half mile from the ocean and when the wind doesn't blow, it is very hot and humid. I really feel sorry for my mechanics. I have had three of them suffer heat exhaustion. I have to watch them like children. Most of them are 20 or younger and they seem to have very little common sense. One man is a black militant, one a Jesus freak, one a drunk, one a marijuana spoke, smoker, and they all conflict with each other. They are constantly bickering with each other. My poor motor sergeant is about to go crazy. He told me yesterday he wants a unit transfer. If he leaves, I think I will too. I would rather fly helicopters 120 hours a month than run that motor pool. I enjoy your letters so much. They are always the high point of my day. I would like to know about Hurricane Agnes a little more if possible. I worry about you being alone in a storm without lights or anything and maybe without a phone. I would love to call you, but I've been unsuccessful all last week. I'll try again Wednesday night when I have duty officer. I just love to hear your voice. Do you remember some of those record calls I used to make to you? Some of them were for over two hours and cost over $30. I guess it's a good thing they limit calls from here to three minutes. They have a regular type phone to the States at the USO that you don't have to say over and all that stuff. I hope to use it next Sunday on our anniversary. I love you more than the day I married you and more than the day I last saw you. It seems impossible for our love to increase, but it does. I love you more and I don't know exactly what else I can say about it, except that it is a miracle blessed by God. All my love always, Joe. And this is a picture from the time period uh, of Martha Ann, you know, around that, that late 60s, early 70s time period. Again, they were married in 71, um, less than a year before he leaves uh, for Vietnam. Um, I want to share another little uh, scene or anecdote here for you. Um, this one, this one's special to me, and I hope I hope readers connect with this. Um, my mother, and you can see her seated there on the right in purple, and that's Harry with his back to the uh, to the camera, and that's Bertha, his wife, and my grandmother in red at the end of the table opposite. And my mother did this a couple of times where she brought uh, the tape recorder and set it on the dinner table and recorded the family having their uh, banter around the table. And I have a good friend, like one of my best friends still to this day from growing up, it's been a friend for a lifetime, Michael Kennedy, used to always joke that he's like, Matt, you're going for your grandfather's birthday again? He thought every other Sunday was my grandfather's birthday because my, fa my family was always gathering around the dinner table, especially on Sunday afternoons and having these big family dinners. And especially after COVID now and uh, the pandemic and the separation we've had from our families, I'm really, uh, I'm, I'm really both feel nostalgic, but feel blessed to be able to get back to a dinner table with family again. And maybe, you know, this experience resonates with you and what your family uh, has experienced, but they're having a, uh, some witty banter around the table. I'm just going to give you a taste of it. I'm not going to read who's talking, but hopefully you get the gist of um, the dialogue that's happening at the table. So this is Joe listening to a cassette recording and he's listening to it on June 15th, 1972. And he's been mailed uh, what happened on, at, the dinner at the dinner table on June 2nd. So this was uh, recorded June 2nd. What time do you miss Joe, Martha? All the time. I guess you do. You had him around the house all the time last month, didn't you? He didn't have to come in and take off his work clothes. I don't miss Freddie when he goes out of town all the time. He'd be at work anyway. I miss him sometimes at night, but if he goes on a weekend, then I'm just in misery the whole weekend. You got nobody to nag at. Martha starts work on Monday. Where? Belks. 
I'll have to go buy my clothes there now that Martha's there. Have to put me a sales price tag on them or something. Ha, ha, she can't change the price, but she'll have to let you know when they've got a good bargain. Yeah, why don't you let me know when they got some pants that look decent, except just plain old Puritan white and black. If you do work in the men's department, please let me know when they got some pants in my size. Size Puritan white and size Puritan black is all they ever have when I go over there. All the other sizes, they got every color in the book, plaid, checks, everything. My size, they got plain old drab colors. Martha Ann, now you don't go and play this tape for your mama and daddy and let them laugh at us. That's what she wants it for. No, I'm not going by there. That's why she's not gonna talk on it. We doing all the talking. She needs to do a little of it. I forgot to tell Joe in the letter I wrote him that Gaynell and those kids are coming back to Charleston. I told him, you did? Me too. I figured he'd already heard. I couldn't think of any news when I was writing. If he doesn't start getting some mail soon, he did. Well, the letters that I read today said he finally did get some mail. Did he say he got the batteries? I asked him on the phone the other morning, he said no. Well, they're gonna have to get some carrier pigeons. They'd have to be awful strong. They'd get plenty tired. They might make it. They'd do just like Paul Revere did. He rode through the town hollering, here come the Yanks. No, that was the Brits. I think you better not repeat your history. You're not up on it. I thought they rode down Broad Street yelling, here come the Yanks, here come the Yanks. No, they might've said, said that during the Civil War or the War of Northern Aggression. Joe will laugh at all this history when we don't know nothing about it. He's an expert on it. He thinks he knows a lot more than he knows. He's pretty smart when it comes to history. So that's just a little segment of um, you know, the dinner table banter, but um, that might connect with some of your experiences around the family table uh, you know, for, for all of you. Um, I'm going to uh, skip a couple of items. I wanted to just share with you, um, this is the Han River in Da Nang, and I'll close with this little, uh, you know, two little vignettes here uh, so we can take some questions. Um, my father spent a lot of time driving from Marble Mountain Airfield into the heart of Da Nang to get parts and return vehicles and to convoy to other bases. And there are moments where he has some very beautiful reflections of just the people, the surroundings, and kind of questioning what's going on around me, you know, because he's sitting in the seat, the soldiers are driving, and as a lieutenant, he gets to sit in the front seat and just ride. And one of those reflections uh, is here. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you that reflection now, but, uh, and it had to do with the um, large number of refugees that were moving through the Da Nang area. At this point in the war, refugees were flooding through, moving further and further south. Um, last week, U.S. engineers bulldozed one of the biggest shanty towns along the road to Da Nang, an effort to cut down on the number of people along the military route. What was a bustling makeshift city is now a field littered with the remnants of temporary buildings. A few days ago, as we passed the area, my eyes locked on a vision that I just can't shake. Amidst the strewn sandbags and cinder blocks was a single copper pipe crooked at the top like a shepherd's staff. A meager stream of water spilled from the pipe. Under it stood an old Vietnamese man, naked, washing himself, his gray hair, mustache, and goatee, thin and scraggly under the drizzle of water. He may have been a Dawi, that is a village elder or chief, but just then he looked meager and vulnerable. How had it come to this for this man? What was I doing in here passing down that road through his country? And to close out here, I'm gonna, I'm going to go back to where I started, and that is um, the opening chapters that get him to Vietnam. The airport scene leads to him riding on an airplane for almost 24 hours, you know, long segments of flights, and he's on an airplane full of other GIs going off the war, and it was a terrible airplane ride. Everybody's depressed. Everybody's smoking. My father's a non-smoker, so I'm going to close on this scene, and this kind of is taking him to Vietnam. Stewardesses sold alcoholic drinks for a dollar as fast as they could tote them down the aisles, while at the same time, the majority of passengers acted like they were racing to get in that last cigarette before walking to the gallows. The air became a putrid mix of body odor, beer belches, and lucky strike plumes, a haze as thick as the LA skyline. As a non-drinker and a non-smoker, I found the brief stops on Hawaii and Guam 
did little to relieve my nose and lungs. By the end of the 25 hour trip, I could hardly wait to get off that plane to breathe fresh air. Approaching the airfield at Tan Sanut Air Force Base outside Saigon at 2100 hours, I could see illumination rounds dropping in the night sky. The attached mini parachutes slowed their descent for 30 to 45 seconds, enough to light up the base's security perimeter as they burned off. I felt the landing gear drop into position, a jolt of adrenaline coursed through me in anticipation of getting off that flight and into the night air. The drag slowed the plane as it aligned itself, reduced thrust, and touched down on the runway. The passenger door opened. Rather than a burst of fresh air, however, the smell that hit me was like a dumpster behind a Chinese restaurant. The stench of rotting food and oppressive humidity enveloped me. I heard the rumbling of artillery and the distinctive thump, thump, thump of mortar fire. I had arrived. I was in Vietnam. So I'll stop there and I just want to invite you to, as he's about to embark on a journey into Vietnam, I'll inv invite you to come on this journey with us, uh, both me and my father, Joe Talon, and experience Vietnam in 1972 with us as he experiences it, savor the love story, you know, ride the emotions of the recovery afterward, um, seek closure with us and meaning during the unlikely quest that follows some four decades later. And then please share the story with your friends and your family and your loved ones. So I'll turn it over to Brooke uh, for questions. Yes, thank you, Matt. Um, so uh, anyone in our Zoom audience here, feel free to raise your hand and ask a question, but I do already have one here in the chat that um, I'd like to ask. This is from Cindy Floyd. Um, how long did it take to write and what were the highlights of writing? Also, congratulations on such a great achievement. Well, the, uh, how, I can't answer how long it took to write. It, it's uh, incalculable, uh, the amount of time it took to write and rewrite. Um, I will say that he, my father handed me those yellow handwritten legal pad sheets and chapters and memories in the fall of 2009. And um, it has been quite an odyssey since then. So uh, we'll round it off at 12 years. Um, but I, I don't know how long it took to write. I mean, obviously this is a very um, challenging story uh, to put together. I would say that the highlights, the highlights are um, getting to know my father uh, as a 25 year old uh, in, in, uh, as, a, as a man before he had children. So a lot of this book does take place uh, before I am born. And, um, you know, I've always had that weird butterfly effect feeling of, well, what if my father was killed in that incident in this book and, and not the other guy? I, do, I, I would not exist. So in exploring this kind of origin story of, of my own, finding out who my father was in, the, in that time period, finding these recordings and these letters so that we could stay true to his voice back then was probably the most uh, illuminating, exciting kind of thing to dig, dig deep in, into that. All right, thank, thank you, Matt. Um, did anyone here in our Zoom audience want to ask a question? Kathleen? I just wanted to tell Matt, thank you for allowing me to read an advanced copy as a military wife who sent a husband into harm's way and as a military mother who sent a son into harm's way. I could so relate, I've never been to war myself but I could hear through your dad's stories. I could hear my husband's stories. I could hear my son's stories. So it's such an important book. I was also impressed how seamless your intro and your last part worked with the main body, which was your dad's story and how the letters were interspersed with newspaper clippings and then his day-to-day -day some of it's so mundane, it reminded me of Catch-22, the novel. And I also want to say hello to your mother, Martha Ann. And you, my dear, are a hero because you, you were on the home front, uh, back here holding down the fort. And, um, and say hello to your father, the Colonel. He sent me a lovely note. Well, dear. thank you. Oh, I see him. Hi, Colonel. He's laid out. <laughs> He's laid out. Hi, sir. 
Well, thank you. Kathleen, we really appreciate your support and your encouragement um, throughout this, this uh, release process and have a lot of respect for the writing and the work that you do and, and giving a voice to, to the families. And, and, you know, speaking a little bit to the construction process of this book, when we, we would deconstruct and reconstruct, we actually carved it into different nuggets. We called them like little vignettes and stories from his childhood and from training. And we got very selective about which ones we put back in, um, you know, into the final piece. And we did the same thing with the letters. You know, we started with transcribing all the letters and then really get pick and choose what actually uh, worked well in the story. And same thing we did with newspaper articles. When we did a deep dive on what's going on in 1972. And we, we just cut and cut and cut and tried to keep um, the ones that, that very, uh, very much moved the story along. And, you know, in an earlier iteration of this many years ago, this manuscript did not have Martha Talon as a key character, and that would have been a great loss for this book and this story. So now she's a central character, and, and, and like you said, you, you know, it resonated with you, and I think it, that love story and also that family on the home front story and her attempts to communicate with him will resonate with a lot of readers. So very glad that we now have her as front and present character. All right, thank you. Uh, does anyone else have a question for Matt? Well, Matt, I'm wondering, as you as you had the opportunity to, to share the book with readers and you've done some events, including uh, tonight, which we're very grateful for, what kind of responses are you getting from people who know you and your dad and maybe some from people who are encountering you for the first time through this book? Yeah, I think um, one of the responses we're getting from, I think, friends and family who actually know us um, I, uh, one quote from a longtime family member, I know Joe, it, they're an in-law, but they've been part of the family for years. I know Joe, but I didn't know this Joe. Uh, and I think that sums it up very well that um, by going back and, and unearthing, and thank goodness, because he did not diligently keep a journal, but he was diligent about writing his uh, young bride. And by keeping those artifacts and, getting, and keeping the cassette tapes, Obviously, this is years before um, Zoom or Skype or any of the ways that our you know, family would communicate between Iraq and Afghanistan with my brother was deployed there, but um, email, all of that. So the cassettes and the letters helped us discover a Joe that we don't know. Um, and I say it in the end of the book, I don't know if war imprints something on your psyche. I don't know if it releases something that's repressed within you. I don't know if it just alters your DNA and damages you or changes you or, you know, but he is a changed person after this Vietnam experience in ways that we weren't sure how to measure. But I think we started to see that change in evolution of who he is by, by being able to reach back to the, the time before the war and in the time leading up to this war and during this war experience. So I think that's the biggest thing is that people know my father. He's gregarious and outspoken and, and never met a stranger, talk to anybody, and he'll share a lot of stories. He's a storyteller, and he'll share stories from his life. But I don't think people ever heard these stories because he's never, like many Vietnam veterans, he was reticent to talk about the details of his Vietnam experience for many, many uh, decades. So, uh, you know, he's a storyteller and a sharer of life, but these particular stories, we had to actually dig in and, and push him uh, to reflect back on, on this stuff. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Our, our friend Celeste is watching on Facebook and said that uh, her dad served two tours in Vietnam and, and was never really able to talk about any of it. And she's uh, very interested in, in reading your book to get a sense of your father's experience and the hope that maybe it gives her some window into, into you know, what her what her own father wouldn't talk about. Uh, one other question, and, and it's not related, but it, uh, I suppose it's related in the grand scheme. You talked a little bit earlier on in response to a question about the, the writing of the book, actually getting the manuscript together. But I'm wondering if you're willing to talk a little bit about the publication of the book as well and, and the path from getting it to manu from manuscript to book. I noticed uh, in the acknowledgments, uh, my friend Susan Cameron Campbell has mentioned, and I know you've gotten to work with Joe and John at Kohler Books. And would you would you say a little bit about what that that process has been for you to bring the book to publication? 
Yeah, I think I think we're um, we're indebted to both of those groups. That's Joggling Board Press with Susan and um, Kohler Books with John Kohler and Joe. I think both of those um, independent presses helped us a lot with this project in in immeasurable ways. So Susan uh, deep went deep with me on editing and pushing this work and. Uh, we do credit Susan with pushing us to add letters. You know, she once she saw the trove of letters that we were able to unearth, um, she really pushed us to say we got to incorporate these these letters and this voice in a meaningful way. Um, so that led me to this you know, very dramatic restructuring and rewrite, where I uh, basically took an existing uh, classic. I would call it like a classic memoir where you start with childhood you get into the high school years, you get into training, army training. Um, Joe graduated college in 69 and did three years of training before he ever met, uh, made it to Vietnam. And then you have the Vietnam experience and then you have you know, the, the, tr the trauma at the end of the Vietnam experience and then the recovery. And then you obviously have some stuff you know, in the modern era when you talk about the quest. So we had it in this normal chronology and a long arc and by adding the letters and being able to get into this journalistic style, instead of being in that, you know, ret retrospective 70 year old reflecting back, we decided that we had the ability, the unique ability to jump right in, get to Vietnam, get there as in the, in the present day voice of a 25 year old, as if you were writing a journal entry every day. So you're, you're it, in doing that, you can't really share anything that's beyond that point in the narrative, uh, but it allowed us to incorporate what we called nuggets, but were all these great stories that we had already written about from his childhood, from training. And then we had to just get very selective about which of those stories made sense to be reflected upon or brought to the fore during the Vietnam experience. So like an example I gave, I think I gave earlier, well, one example would be he went fishing one afternoon with his motor pool men. And that, that prompted him to think of, you know, a fishing trip and some fishing stories from, from before the war, you know, and from his childhood. So there are things that happen sometimes in Vietnam that trigger a memory and it allows us to hopefully very logically place that memory or that reflection during the Vietnam experience. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit of the process, but I, you know, we credit Susan, your friend, you know, our mutual friend, Susan from Joglin Board Press with really helping us with it, uh, pushing the editorial work and and pushing the structure, pushing the boundaries of structure. Uh, and then, you know, John at Kohler and his team, um, he has some great design folks. I was very concerned about the interior layout. Not only do they do a beautiful cover design, but the interior layout is such a challenge with this project because we're bringing in all these different components, letters, excerpts from a yearbook, audio transcriptions, you know, newspaper articles, photos, I mean, it is all over the board. Email, we even have some email excerpts when you get to the quest. So they did, I think, a very great job of working the interior layout so that the reader knows they're getting a different element, but hopefully it doesn't put the reader off or make the reader pause or trip up while they're reading, while they're reading the, the uh, 100 days. Um, do we have time for one more question? I kind of wanted to ask a question. And I'm not sure where it's headed yet, but I've been, it's been rolling around in my head. After you read the uh, uh, letter, the love letter, I was wondering, I know you just mentioned about the letters when they came into the book, but if it was kind of always known that the letters would be there or did you start adding them and you realize it added more to the story? And the reason I'm asking about the, the letter, the love letters, as I call them, and um, is because uh, my stepfather who passed away a couple of months ago who was in Vietnam um, talked a pretty good bit about the war, but he had a little box that he kept a picture of a woman named Catherine who was the first woman that he ever loved apparently. And I think that was a picture that he may have taken with him when he got sent to Vietnam. Uh, but obviously nothing became of that love. So I'm just wondering with the love juxtaposed with you know the war and loss, uh, how did that? When you start adding the letters in with the stories of Vietnam, how that? I don't know those two things together, right? Just the war robbed so many people of so many things: family, love, and uh, relationships. So 
I just wanted to kind of hear what, you know, I guess what emotional weight did it give to the, to the project? Yeah, I think. I'm not sure that was the question, but those were my thoughts. <laughs> All right. Well, the first part of your question was, I'll answer quickly. And that is we did not, I didn't know the letter's existence at the beginning of the project. So, and I think in hindsight, that's a, that's a real advantage. Um, Cause we were able to do a lot of work and a lot of, um, you know, mining the depths of memory and, and cross-checking some things and trying to put together some stories without the benefit of the letters. Um, those letters contain some intensely personal dialogue. So maybe my mother held them and didn't tell us about them on purpose. Uh, but when we unearthed the letters and found them and, uh, you know, I transcribed them, um, you know, it was, it was clear that we needed some of that in the story. Uh, and I think to your second point is, if we didn't have that and we didn't have her as such a character and we didn't have the love story, we would be missing um, a large, you know, if you look at our subtitle, A Memoir of Love, War and Survival, we chose that subtitle because those are three of the main themes in the book. And we would be missing one of our thematic legs, I think, of the book to not have the love story and uh, would really um, be a lesser, a lesser story and a lesser um, project and book as a total if we did not have that deep, uh, that deep love story and, and being able to connect um, with mul multiple facets of a, how a deployment and how a war affects a family. And um, that's, that's the thing that I think, I hope readers take away. One, th one of the many things I hope they take away is oftentimes when we look at war and we look at the Vietnam War Memorial, which is such a striking memorial, the, the names on the wall are only those who are killed and it's hard to say only because it's like 58,000 plus names, but it, that's the tip of the iceberg when you think of the effect that war has on the families, it has on the wounded veterans, it has on you know, the epidemic of suicide of our veterans from all generations. You think about the cost to the Vietnam civilians, you know, the Vietnamese civilian life law. So the, the, the extreme I think we all often like look at these statistical numbers from the, when we're studying history of wars and we think of, oh, which, which war had the most death and we stack these numbers. But I think, um, you know, when, you, when you're able to paint this bigger picture, you see how, you know, just in the lives of Daniel Richards and Joe Talon and the ripple effect of what happened on one night in August 12, 1972 and how that affected so many people. And you just, you know, multiply that out over all the people who are involved in, in, in war over time. So I think those are the kind of things that we get by, uh, I think we get to that better by adding in the love story, the letters, and these different uh, components. Um, you know, and, and, and to, that, to that point, the adding of the newspaper articles, which is a risk on our part. We weren't sure if that was too off-putting to the reader, but we're both history teachers in the past. And we thought it important to situate Joe's experience and what was going on in 72 at the time. And we thought that that would be beneficial to the reader. And it just so happened that there were a lot of interesting things happened, happening in the 104 days he was there. So it also worked well with our narrative. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. Does anyone have another question or? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, we had a comment from someone on Facebook, uh, Monica Dar. Oh, hey, Monica. Uh, says, thank you, Matt, for sharing the personal side of war from a soldier's point of view and experience and that of his family back home. Thank you, Monica. And to Jonathan, Jonathan's point earlier about Celeste, Celeste's reaction to the book, we are getting that reaction a lot, uh, Jonathan. And, and that is when you read my introduction and I talk about not, not doing my due diligence with my grandfather, Harry, he spent some time with me and he shared some information, but there was more to be gained there and there was more to be done. And he dies before I am able to really sit down and take the time to do that. That has resonated with a lot of people in, in, you know, that was World War II, but that's resonated with a lot of people of my age and my era about their parents who were in Vietnam. 
and saying that like, look, either, you know, my parent can't talk about it or my parent has already passed. And so there is, a, I think that's a common reaction to the book is uh, that we're hearing right now in the early week, you know, week plus of sharing it with the public is that a lot of people have said that, you know, so-and-so was in Vietnam, but we could never get him to talk or he's gone now and I wish I could do this, that, or the other. Yeah. Matt? Yes. I was going to say, so your grandfather, Harry, I would like to believe that Harry knows. And you had me on Harry and you had me as you were try writing about yourself as a young lieutenant. And when I realized when you said I had time, that opening line, I had time is so good. And then I think you close that forward, I had time. Um, it just made me reflect. And also with the letters, with Martha Ann's letters and Joe's letters back and forth, it really, the one word that comes to mind for me as a military family member is longing. The longing, the longing for home, the longing for each other. And also to, to the Colonel, I really appreciated your empathy, sir, when you wrote about seeing the old Vietnamese man standing out there trying to bathe under the water and you and you talked about those people and what they were going through and that you were in their country. So I'll stop now, but I really did love the book and I've told many people about it. So congratulations. Hey, thank you. Hmm. Well, I don't see any more questions in our chat box. Um, did anyone else want to make a comment or ask a question before we end our evening here with Matt? No? Nope. All right. Well, thank you all for, um, oh, let's see. Vicki Henry said, great job. Oh, you can see it. Great job, Matthew. Good to see both Martha and Joe. Thank you, Vicki. <laughs> Yeah, thank you all for uh, coming. This has been great, Matt. Thank you so much for doing this with us. And uh, we look forward to someday soon, maybe seeing you in, in person. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the support uh, that the Pat Conroy Literary Center has given our project. And as you can see, even before I was born back in 1976, uh, the, <laughs> kernel, the kernel of this story was being germinated, you know, the the uh, partnership with Pat Conroy Center and just the love of Pat Conroy's writing. Uh, my mother passed that down to me uh, at a very early age. So really uh, appreciate the work that your center is doing. Yeah, thank you. Jonathan, did you want to say something? He's, he's on mute. Okay. Yes, uh, thank you, Matt, for, for tonight, for the presentation, for the gift of the book, which I think is going to mean quite a lot to so many people. It's it's a wonderful creative act and a wonderful act of, of empathy and storytelling for you and your dad to do this. So thank you so much for sharing it with us tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Sounds like the phone is ringing here at the center. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Uh, have a good night. Good night.